What is proper time? Well, for you, it is the time that you see in your clock. For me, it is what I see in my clock. Really, it's that simple. Bro, what are you talking about, man? Yeah, but that makes proper time a trivial concept, right? Wrong. It is a non-trivial one and quite important. How that is, is the topic of this video. We will explore the definition of proper time, when do we need to use it, how it is different from coordinate time, you know, the one that we use to mark the time axis in the space-time diagrams that we draw, and why the idea of proper time is so important in relativity. So let's just begin. Okay, right off, the definition. Proper time for an object or an observer is the time shown by the clock which is at rest with respect to that object or observer. When the second postulate of special relativity says time flows differently for observers or objects in relative motion with respect to each other, it is referring to the different proper times of those respective objects or observers. Now, a word of caution. A word of caution. Often, people confuse phrases like time flows or time speeds up or slows down, etc. and visualize time as an object flowing from here to there and run into all sorts of conceptual mess. For example, I have seen people discuss what would happen if time flows faster than light itself, which is a totally meaningless question, so please do not go that way. What this statement actually means is clocks in different reference frames tick at different rates, showing different proper time intervals between the same pair of events. This we have discussed in an earlier video on time dilation. Check out the card above if you like. Anyway, since proper time flows differently for objects in different frames, that is, objects in relative motion with respect to each other, whenever we are talking about time, we should first take note of whose time it is that we are talking about, okay? So let us see what I mean by that. To understand that, first note that there are two aspects to any physics problem. One is ourselves, the group of observers, you know, the onlookers, with our reference frames and rulers and clocks and space-time coordinates, thermometers, barometers and whatnot. The other is the physical system that is being observed or that is under the study. A person running or a planet in motion or a ball rolling down a hill or particles colliding, whatever. Sometimes the system being observed is in motion with respect to us observers and according to special relativity should experience a different flow of time than what we experience. But more often than not, the relative speed is so small compared to the speed of light that this difference goes completely unnoticed. In that case, we say we are dealing with a non-relativistic system and fall back to our good old Galilean or Newtonian framework of absolute time. Only when the relative speed is extremely high and becomes a sizable fraction of the light speed, we say that we are dealing with the so-called relativistic system. In this case, we cannot ignore the difference in the time experienced by the system and that experienced by ourselves any longer and we have to reject the Galilean or Newtonian notion of an absolute time and deal with two different proper times, one for the observer and another for the system being observed. Now, in physics, the end goal for studying any physical system is to predict its future course of action or its fate, so to speak. So, in a way, all physicists are nothing but fortune tellers. Together, we shall cast ourselves into the future. Anyway, to predict the future of a system, we should not need our proper time. Ideally, we can ignore it completely and work solely with the system's proper time. Because it is the system that is under the spotlight here, being studied and all. And it will evolve according to its own proper time. But often, it is inconvenient or impractical or even impossible to read what the clock carried by the system says. After all, it is moving with an extremely high speed, remember? Thus, what we actually want is to chart out how this system evolves with the passage of our proper time, so that we can predict its future course of action as per our clock readings. Therefore, while dealing with relativistic systems, we have to work with two different proper times. One is the time shown by the clocks in our wrist frame, for example, our wristwatch or our mobile phones, etc. These give us our proper time, and we use it to mark the time axis of the space-time diagram that we draw for the system. By the way, we have a video where we have explained how to draw space-time diagram, what do we mean by an event and its space-time coordinates, how events are observed, who observes them, and how these observers are placed, you know, the whole nine years. So make sure you check it out. Link is in the i button and also in the description. So our proper time serves as the time coordinate and we always refer to it as the coordinate time. We never even think of it as proper time. For the rest of this video also, we will refer to our proper time as coordinate time just to avoid any possible confusion. The other time of concern 
is shown by the rest frame clock of the system under observation. It is the system's proper time, which dictates its time evolution. We refer to it as the proper time. Since we mostly cannot or do not observe the system's proper time, we have to somehow calculate it. But that can be done quite easily because we know exactly how the time readings shown by the system's rest frame clock is related to our coordinate time. Here is how. If we draw the world line of a non-uniformly moving guy in our space-time diagram, each point on that world line is an event encountered or witnessed by that moving guy. At two such events 1 and 2, the clock carried by this guy reads tau1 and tau2 respectively, whereas our clock reads t1 and t2. So just to reiterate, tau1 and tau2 are the proper time values, whereas t1 and t2 are the coordinate time values associated to the events 1 and 2 respectively. These two pairs of time readings are related by this integral. We have explained how this relation can be obtained in an earlier video, so let me not go into all that. If you care to find out, again, the link is in the i button and also in the description. Thus, from our coordinate time readings for the two events, we can calculate what is the corresponding proper time interval shown by the clock carried by this moving guy. Now, in this moving guy's rest frame, all events on his world line have the same spatial location, his location, the origin of his rest frame, if you may. So, in his rest frame, all these events are separated by time only. Whereas, in our frame, these events are separated both temporally and spatially from each other. So this guy has a unique perspective to all the events on his world line that no observers in other reference frames can have. For him, the space-time interval between events on his world line appears as purely time interval shown by his clock. Because of this unique nature or unique feature, we refer to it as the proper time interval. So we can define proper time interval between two events as the time interval shown by a clock which is present at both the events. But instead of time intervals, if we are interested to map that moving guy's clock readings, that is his proper time, to our coordinate time, just one on one, all we need is to set both the clock readings to zero at the start of our observation. Since choosing the origin in any coordinate axis is a matter of uh, choice, so we can do that for the time axis as well. Let's see how that works in action. We choose to set event 1 as the start of our observation and set both tau1 and t1 to 0. Then the relation gives us the clock readings tau2 of the moving guy in terms of our coordinate time reading t2. In fact, there was nothing special about either event 1 or event 2 except for the fact that they are on the world line of this moving guy. So this will work for any event successive to event 1 on the world line of this moving guy. So we can drop the tag of event 2 from this relation and write a general relation connecting the proper time tau of this guy with our coordinate time t. Let us see how proper time can act as a parameter to track the world line. We have been observing this moving fellow. So we already have all his spatial location data tagged with the corresponding coordinate time data. Thus, we can write his trajectory through space as a function of our coordinate time. But we also have the way to find out the clock reading of this moving guy with our coordinate time readings. So we can invert that relation to write coordinate time as a function of the proper time of this guy. Using this inverted relation, we can also write the special trajectory as a function of this guy's clock time or proper time. Thus, we now have both the spatial and temporal coordinates of this guy as measured from our frame as a function of his proper time. Collectively, these spatial and temporal coordinates are called space-time coordinates and written as a space-time coordinate for vector x mu. In other words, we have his space-time trajectory or world line written as a parameterized curve where his proper time serves as parameter. This idea is extremely important because as we have mentioned, any system time evolves according to its proper time and therefore when we are setting up differential equations that governs the system's dynamics, it is only natural that we should take its proper time as the independent variable. If you have seen the application of Newton's second law in mechanics, you should be able to appreciate this. In non-relativistic mechanics, we equate the mass of a body times its acceleration to the resultant force applied on that body, which gives us a second order differential equation of the position vector x of the body in three-dimensional space with time as the independent variable. Since we are talking non-relativistic scenario here, the coordinate time read by the observer's clock 
the proper time of the object that is the thing under observation all are identical or indistinguishable from each other so we say flow of time is the same for all and refer to it simply as time and treat it as the independent variable but in relativistic mechanics proper time takes the role of independent variable and both spatial coordinates and coordinate time that is the time that we have been referring to earlier as absolute time become the dependent variable for which we set up the 3 plus 1 dimensional or space time equivalent of the force equation of course we shall elaborate a lot more on this in future videos where we discuss dynamics of a relativistic particle in details so stay tuned if you are interested if you have found this video useful give me a feedback on the comment section also feel free to let me know if you disagree with anything i have said or shown here thanks for your time and i hope to see you next time bye bye